This is a really special panel. Um, I think one of the reasons that make it special is that Andrew is the one that came up with the topic idea and he texted it to me and he says, let's call it this. Go ahead, what do you have feedback on this? I don't know if I had that much influence on the title. I was talking about the consults, but you guys went for that like dramatic well, title that, that caused a little controversy on so social media. We I did suppose. a little controversy and the first controversy um, within six seconds of posting the topic on social media, I got a text from this guy and he just sends me a screenshot with two question marks. <laughs> right, it was just typical Todd Caputo text message. And, um, you know, so uh, he's like, what, what is this? You know, because he's like, I'm a consultant now. And um, what, what, what I did was reminded him of the very, back when he had stores and my agency congruent did work rebranding, one of our most successful posts of all time was one of the first posts we made with his rebrand, which was transitioning from Todd Caputo, the used car king, which Todd would, uh, prominently be featured in infomercials as cars paraded by, and he would you know, tell you about the features and the benefits, to Sun Automotive Group, simple, upfront, and nice. And Todd started building out a, a holistic brand that really worked well. And what we did was engaged in this conversation of empathy where the Facebook post said, had a picture of Todd, and it said, dealers have been ripping people off for years. And Todd, Todd goes, what if they think it's me? And I was like, they already think it's you, but now at least we can talk about it. But it's not true, I wasn't doing that. He was not, he was not. But that engaged, actually, that post was our best performing post of all time because it also got people back to actual VDPs from a conversational post. So this, this uh, topic of stop wasting money on consultants isn't, we're not saying that every dollar on a consultant is wasted, but what we are saying is that there are a lot of dollars wasted on consultants. And so in the spirit of collaboration, um, I have three people on this panel that are, are very um, experienced with how to integrate consultants well and how to set your team up well for success when we are embarking on the very much needed outside objectivity into the, the dealerships and the operations that we are head down in passionate about, so much so that we rarely get the opportunity to get up, take a breath and slow down and look around. So uh, let me introduce uh, the panel. Well, to my left here is the lovely Kimberly Barda, the CMO of Group One. And I think her experience, you've been one of the, the best uh, clients I've ever worked with, but also uh, one of the savviest when it comes to understanding the empathy of how people feel when a consultant comes or another agency comes into the business. Todd Caputo, a uh, second generation dealer and uh, was acquired by Sonic several years ago and now has uh, dedicated his time to going, he just can't stay away from the dealers, but he wants to be in a store, right? Helping solve the problems that he solved so well when he was a dealer. And then Andrew DeFeo um, of Hyundai, of St. Augustine. Um, you know, he, uh, Andrew, you're, you're like a real sleeper in my mentality because I didn't, I hadn't even known you a year ago. And, and uh, after I met you the first time, I was like, huh, I, there's something about this guy. And then the more I learned and the more I talked to you and he, he's dropping LinkedIn posts about, he went to a conference and was watching and listening to Mr. Beast which, how many people know who Mr. Beast is? Okay, so some people have kids in here. Um, <laughs> Mr. Beast, uh, the most popular YouTuber. And so I think we have a really good panel. Uh, questions, uh, we want questions, right? A lot of you either are consultants, work in that capacity, or have dealerships. And so uh, you probably know how it works by now. In the app, just tap on this session, ask some questions, and we'll make sure we get them answered. So um, I'm gonna kick off, uh, Kimberly, with you. In our prep, panel prep call, we talked a lot about making sure your team is ready for a consultant if you want to make sure the relationship is successful. Why is that so important? I think the team can kind of make or break the relationship. And so I think one of the things I've learned over the years is to make that engagement really productive is a tremendous amount of prep work. And I think it's a little bit illusory. I think early in my career, I thought, oh, we bring in consultants and then take some work off of our shoulders. And that may happen eventually, but that prep work is so important. And I think understanding the people who are gonna be detractors, the people who are gonna have their guard up, people who are like, might be you know, really concerned about it, and then the people who are excited about it, and being able to communicate that um, in an appropriate way to the people who are coming in just helps set the stage for making a better, better collaboration. And I do really look at it as collaboration because I've had experiences where brought in consultants who are incredible thought leaders, but we walked away with a 
expensive white paper. And then I've had experiences where um, we really learned how to operationalize it. Um, so I hope that answers the question. It does. What, why don't we talk about, for a second, tag on to that. What is, you said you know, sometimes we have very expensive consultant and that we ended up with uh, an expensive white paper. What is the other side of that negative experience with a consultant when a consultant comes in and the team isn't fully prepared? What, what's the result of that? I think when the team isn't fully prepared, you just waste a lot of time in the beginning. Um, and part of that prep is absolute clarity between you, your team, and the consultant, like what you're after. You know, you might meander on the process, but I think, you know, be as rigorous about bringing somebody on as a consultant as you would if you were bringing on a full time hire. You know, I, I think that rigor up front, I just, for me, that's just one of the biggest learnings is spend that time, you know, and be very intentional about what the long-term objectives are, short-term, if it's a short-term engagement. Andrew, um, you, you kind of brought as much credit or not that you want to take for this. You brought this to the table because it was something you were passionate about. So why, why were you passionate about it and kind of like what is your experience when it comes to things going well or not well? So I'll give you a, a 30 second background of me is I have a PhD and many people in this room know that as Papa has dealership and everything in my life uh, up until my 40s has come extremely easy. And it's I kind of looking back on it. The reason why it was wasn't because I was so amazing. It's because I never got uncomfortable and challenge myself. I had blinders. Uh, I was the, uh, the, I loved new cars. It's kind of my baby. I was uh, the chairman of the Hyundai National Dealer Council uh, and new cars were, were, were my passion. Uh, but I wanted to get uncomfortable and uh, my friend Todd here had, uh, the, you know, used car king, um, sold the businesses, went to work for Sonic and I knew intentionally that I needed to get uncomfortable and get back into the used used car game, but I had it, the, the, the timing had to be right. And we want uh, talking about getting the team involved. And one of the you know you can waste money on consultants if your team isn't ready for this. So don't go down the path of hiring a consultant unless you are creating a culture that's ready to accept a consultant uh, you know on board. And uh, you know. I, I, the, uh, I've challenged myself a lot. Uh, I was a extrovert uh, in my 20s and 30s. I became a bit of an introvert in my 40s. And now I'm trying to come out of my shell again with my team members. And Todd's been a, a great help uh, for that. And one of the things, and this isn't just a, an, an ad for Todd, it's for any consultant that's really important is that they meet as many team members in your dealership as possible. Uh, and not that they're going to be spending a lot of time with every one of those team members, but just it, it shows that this is a team effort. This isn't just about one or two people or just your executive leadership team. Uh, we heard earlier um, you know, from Ed about communicating that vision and it's one collective effort. It's, this is not one person or two people. It is the whole entire organization. And it's important uh, to, to go into, you know, working with a consultant that you get as many people involved as possible. You know, Todd, I, I, I still see you as a dealer because most of our relationship, you were a dealer and you know, you still go, I'm still a dealer, right? Like you'll still a dealer. You'll, or I can never get it well, you should blood. see his garage now because he still lives on bring a trailer and now he's either installing double decker lifts in your garage. So I do have a problem with cars. He yes. has a, I want to get a t-shirt that says I have a problem with cars rather than yes. I, I my name is Todd yes. and I have a problem with cars and, and so admit it in front of everybody. Yes. He basically has just convinced his wife that this is how he can have a personal inventory because he does sell them eventually. Right. It's true. I know I see this cheap business, but over, over my uh, experience with you as a dealer, I had a front row seat to a major transition inside your store where you hire consultants to change you from your um, 50 year, 40 year um, negotiating model to a not negotiation free model. And you know that was a big time of change in your industry and you were able to successfully integrate consultants with your business. So maybe you could talk about a little bit about that and, and why it worked. So I hired um, consultants a few times when I was a dealer and I wanted to hire a consultant that I knew would help me was something that I had general knowledge of what to do, but not specific knowledge. 
when it was a major, major change in my business. The first time I hired a consultant was uh, to put in a centralized BDC for my car dealerships. I had an idea of what to do. I read a lot about it, but I didn't know how to really be hands-on and do it because it's extremely detail-oriented. It needs to be done right, and that's why I hired somebody. I I found out who was the best, and I, I brought him in, and, and he did it. Uh, and the second time that I did it, which was even a bigger change, is when I went to one price and one person, and um, I actually used two consultants for that. I started with one and finished up with another only because of the fact that the, the first consultant that I hired helped me get it actually in place. And then the second consultant that I hired helped me really kind of manage the process after it was done. Um, and again, it was not comfortable like you brought up and you brought up, right? Like when you bring somebody in from the outside, it's not necessarily, not necessarily comfor comfortable for you as an owner, but it's also a huge fear for your people. And when I hired a consultant, my people were all like, well, why, why are you bringing this person in? What are they doing? And then when I work with dealers or even vendors, cause I work with a lot of vendors too, they wonder the same thing. Like, who is this guy? Why is he here? So, you know, explaining the why, like you said, Kimberly, like is so, so important because from a consultant's perspective, and I know there's a few of you in the room here, um, it makes our job a lot more difficult if people don't understand why. And it's not, so we're gonna give people grades or say that you should, fire somebody, it's, that's not the reason you're here. I look at it, if I'm coming into a dealership or I'm working with a vendor, it's about opportunities, right? It's, it's, it's finding opportunities to make the business better um, from a perspective where at the end of the day, I don't have, there's, there's no, uh, I, I don't win by pointing out opportunities, right? I, I, the people in the dealership win or the vendor wins when I do that and I just try to like, I, I try to take that um, resistance down because people get so nervous when, when I come in. So if the owners or the executive leadership team in your case, right, because you work for a publicly traded company, explain why um, in detail um, with everybody involved in the organization, it's extremely helpful. So you've, you've actually seen both sides of it. And I, I assume walking in as a consultant, all of a sudden you're like, I totally know how these other people are feeling right now when we're like, hey, this is Todd. He's really good at these things. And he's, here. you know, it's like I'm with the government and I'm here to help, right? <laughs> it's, it's really what it kind of feels like, I'm sure, to people, especially the people who made the decisions that are currently in place, right? Because now it's going to be scrutinized and there's probably a level of insecurity because they, they, you're there because something's not working, right? Or something needs to be working better. So um, this is for all of you. And now like we can just engage in this conversation, feel free, um, you know, and whatever. Tell, tell, let's talk about the alignment. You've decided you need a consultant or you want a consultant for a specific, you know, trajectory or lane in your business. Where does the prep work start? Like, how do you start to build alignment in your team? Who do you talk to first? And how, how much do you communicate coming in? Like, how do you disarm people? Anybody? Um, I, I don't know if I could answer that first, but I, I would say this. <sighs> you know, change is not easy for people at all, uh, no matter what the industry is. And I think that, you know, if I put myself in an owner's perspective when I used to be an owner, um, you know, I think you have to show people what's happening in the world around you. When, when I decided to go um, with a BDC, I, I showed everybody in the dealership, especially the salespeople that got very apprehensive, right? Like, wait a minute, we can handle leads, right? Well, you say you can handle leads, but you're, you're busy selling cars and you can't get back to people as quickly as they need to be responded to when you're handling leads. And this is actually gonna make your life easier so you can just sell more cars and not have to worry about, you know, taking care of leads and doing some follow-up that's necessary. Uh, and then going to one price and one person, you know, before I did that, I did um, about a year and a half worth of diligence, which I've shared with you before, right? Like I visited a mystery shop, CarMax. Um, I got a behind the scenes look at CarSense, which was an independent used group that Penske ended up buying. Um, I got a behind the scenes look at Echo Park, which at the time didn't know it was gonna actually, my stores are gonna become an Echo Park, but uh, Elite had set that up because they were using software. So I did a lot of diligence before um, 
decided to go one price. You also went, didn't you go like the Walzer or Chomp or both of them? I did. I went to Walzer and Chomp. I went to all of them, right? Because I did not take the decision lightly to go one person and one price at all. And when I had to explain the why to everybody, they were, they did not get it, right? Like they just didn't get it. They didn't understand. When we went to Roadster, which I know you use, right? Like they didn't, they didn't understand it. So explaining to them the why, number one, and number two, you have to show people how it affects them um, at the end of the week when they get paid. Because uh, at the end of the day, that, that's how people are driven. Um, no matter what anybody says, everybody for the most part is it's, driven yeah, by right. money. Yeah, right, it's not the hobby. 100%. Right, it's my job. Yeah, so how can finding, how can a consultant help the people in the organization ultimately um, become better at what they do and make more money? Any other perspectives? Yeah, just thinking about alignment. You know, I think about the most successful people I know ask for help. And so when I've been vulnerable with the team and said, I really can't make this change without some external help, but more importantly, I can't do it without you. There's just kind of like everyone sort of like lets their guard down and goes, okay. And the other thing I've learned that if it is a change that you want to implement in the stores, have more people from the stores involved in the engagement with the consultant than you do the executive team. And that's a little weird. Okay, I think we, you probably need to just, say that again. Okay. Have more people have involved. Have more people involved from the stores because A, they're brilliant and B, they're on the front lines. And you know, we think we know what's happening in the stores, but unless we actually sit there and work out of the dealership, we really don't. So have more people from the stores involved in the engagement than you do on your executive team. I'm not saying don't have people on your team, but have them, but have the people that are going to be implementing that work. And then I think the other learning for me is w when people from the stores are listened to and are really engaged, then when you roll something out, you have advocates and it's not this kind of weird top down, we're going to do it this way. Because you know, especially at the store level, like they have all the relationship equity with one another. And no matter what it seems like when you're around, especially if you're a high level executive or an owner, why, does everybody just tell you the bad news? No. No, they what tell, they you, tell what you, you they think you want to hear and then they could turn around and do exactly what they would. <laughs> exactly. So I think, I think that's amazing to, to understand the buy-in on the front line for it, with as many people as possible. Because you can get one, but then you're relying on that one person to be the convincing party to everyone else. I think that's very good advice. So, you know, one thing I'll share is, I'm right now I'm working with a very large group. They've got like 40 stores and we're trying to standardize certain things. And I want to be able to make recommendations to standardizing, especially when the things comes to used cars, they come to used cars. But um, I have to learn about how they operate because they're very decentralized. So a promise that I made to all the general managers was that I was going to basically spend a day or two with them and their store to actually see what happens. So a couple of weeks ago, I, I traveled and um, I literally was there at eight o'clock when the GM walked in. And when he locked up at night, locked up the gate in the back to leave, I was with him as well. And I made him a promise I would do that for two days. Um, when I go visit Andrew's stores or some other clients, I try to do the same it's, thing. It's not at eight o'clock with me, by no, the way. We, <laughs> well, we start texting at about yeah, five. That's true. We're that's up early, true. but um, I mean, I can't, as a consultant, I can't make a recommendation um, unless I know what people are living every single day uh, in a car dealership. It's impossible. Or if I'm working with a vendor, uh, it's the same thing, right? You can't. And let, you can say this is a best practice for this and this is a best practice for that, but every business has its challenges. Um, car dealership has challenges with parking cars and being able to you know, put things in certain places and then there's, there's challenges with people. There's challenges with technology because you know, the industry is so broken when it comes to software that's not integrated and there's, there's different challenges with training. So it's important for, regardless of the consultant that you do hire, to really understand what goes on in the dealership or what goes on in anybody's business on a daily basis, like what happens? I'm doing work with a nonprofit pro bono, right? Like I, I've gone and volunteered, so I understand exactly what they're going through on a daily basis because it's not fair for me to come in and write up a white paper like you said, right? When it's not really based on the reality of the challenges of the business. Yeah. The, uh, I want to touch on a word that Kimberly used earlier is vulnerability and be 
be very open to, to being vulnerable and being challenged. And uh, in the session before, we heard about one-on-ones. And typically, we think about one-on-ones being metrics. And, and I was a metrics guy, and I'm trying to, to take myself away from that. Letty earlier today talked about the personal productivity uh, matrix and, and focusing on that versus that gross PBR uh, mindset. Uh, my grandfather started the business uh, in the 50s and you know 60s, 70s, and 80s. There weren't computers. There weren't cell phones. There wasn't a, a screen to hide behind. They managed by walking around and meeting and talking to his, his employees and his customers. And I think we need to get back to that mindset of not hiding behind a computer screen because we think those are the tasks that are important. And it's being busy versus being effective uh, is, is uh, something that uh, has kind of been a theme of a lot of the, the sessions that I've uh, sat through uh, the last couple of days here. One of the things I wanted to mention, uh, and this is super important, right? If you decide to hire a consultant, you have to be willing to change. Um, you know, and I, sometimes I'll struggle with this. And well, don't you think that if someone hires a consultant, that's an indicator? Well, they, they, they may. Yeah, they I may think you'd be surprised how many people hire consultants and then they like they don't do Why anything. Why come in and tell you what you're doing right? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I mean. You and I were talking about this the other day, right? Um, Tom does this for, and it's about compliance. And when it comes to compliance things, you have to make, in some cases, a lot of major, major changes. There's got to be willpower from the executive team, in your case, right? Or from the owner or the owner's son or daughter or whoever in a, in a, in a smaller operation. If there isn't the willpower at the top to make some of the changes and to really you know create more opportunity to to do more business and to improve your processes then it's not going to work um so i always try to make sure that i've um I'm, I'm teamed up with with the right people and you know in a couple of cases i've actually started consulting and then i've left because i realize i'm not going to get anywhere and i don't want to just do it to get paid it's not about getting paid for me it's about making some real changes and finding those opportunities and putting some processes in place. There's no point in me doing it and just getting a check if we're not gonna actually make things better. And that's really important to think about if you're gonna hire a consultant for sure. I, I think one thing that, that you know, going down the consultant uh, you know, road uh, path with, with Todd has kind of helped me and my team kind of transition to a growth mindset. And, uh, you know, I hate to keep bringing up Ed Roberts, but he's a, he's a pretty smart guy. It's hard and not to bring up Ed. It's hard not to bring up Ed. And earlier today, he talked about the post office. And they've been doing the same thing for decade after decade. And they just keep raising their prices. And I paraphrasing, but he said, we don't want to be the post office. Okay. We want to have that, that, that growth mindset of it's, it's not about perfection, it's about progress and just advancement and keep going and learning and and not everything is a step forward there's going to be some steps sideways there's going to be some some steps back but hopefully you've created a culture that allows that and it's a safe space that to just keep progressing forward kimberly um you came into the industry with a a, a retail background and you worked with lots of big companies and i'm surely also employed consultants came into automotive um, in group one I think they brought you on board because they wanted to see some major wholesale change in the marketing trajectory. Um, so you stepped into a situation where people are probably already very afraid, right? Um, almost like, yes, you coming in as the executive, but also kind of experiencing likely a similar feeling from your staff as if when you bring in like a really high powered consultant that's going to, they know is going to also come in and deploy change. Can you tell us a little bit about when you came into Group One and how you handled the team and their emotions and you know the feelings that you knew they had about the change that was coming? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I would start by saying, I'll talk about my team, but I, I wanna talk about my peers first. A big proof point for me coming to Group One was that before I came, I spent a lot of time with the executive team and the people that would be my peers, and there was no pressure uh, to make a decision quickly whatsoever. And I knew that these were people I could sit with in a room and have a disagreement about the way we wanted to do a business process or something that we were thinking about, strategy, whatever. 
and that I could leave that room and nobody would be gunning for me. And so I came in with a sense of trust from the leadership team, which was really, I think, important. And, and you're right about the marketing team. They're like, who's this person who hasn't been in auto all their life? You know, and, and so I think there are two things. Um, I mean, I'm still in the process of making change because I'm sort of in it for the long haul and I don't feel like I have to make every change right away. Um, in my case, it was being a very good listener and then secondly, bringing the team together often and just being hugely transparent about what I was thinking and letting people kind of bang it around, agree with it or disagree with it. And being extremely honest that while I felt like I had a lot to offer from other industries and I had sort of a very much a customer insights, you know, mindset that because there was plenty I didn't know about auto, there was a reliance on them. And because I just never faked it, you know, and could walk down the hall and say, how does this work? I don't get it. You know, I think there was kind of a value exchange that that helped with that. But you'd have to you'd have to ask my team. But I think you're you're right about I did kind of have that feeling of being a consultant when I first came in. You use the word honest and transparent. Andrew used the word vulnerable. Um, all three obviously are, are very closely related. And I think that really considering that as you bring outside voices in your organization, it's just been my personal experience that when you're willing to be very honest and vulnerable yourself as much as you can, at the outset is where you get the most ROI on your time. Because if you're willing to tell, um, let me kind of like bring this down to a, a dealership level responsibility. If you're changing, you know, uh, to a one price model and you have that salesperson who is old school and you know, they've been there, they've been doing things the same way. And you know, that's the person that is likely to cause the most problem to talk behind your back the most and try to like in, in, probably just self-preservation mode, right? Because there's a lot of fear that comes with it. To bring that person in and vulnerability, be like, hey, I've never done this model and I know you are on the front lines every day and you know, you know what the customers are coming in and saying. So I really need you to help us work through this situation. I need your advice. I need your help. And similar to you, like I'm not, I haven't been in the car business. And being willing to do that at the beginning, do you think that person is then going to try to get you more allies or try to push back. And so the vulnerability piece, I lean in on it because it's just a human dynamic that everyone fears, fears or feels. And, and fears. And, and fears. They fear it. Well, they, they feel the fear, right? Yeah. The fear is it. And we know from like great minds like Seth Godin, they talk about the lizard brain and what happens when the boss says, hey, can, can I talk to you in my office for a minute? It's never, oh good, they finally recognize all the hard work I've been doing. Right? No, it's not that. It's like, oh my gosh, I did something wrong. I don't know what, but I'm going to get fired. I'm not going to be able to pay my mortgage. I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to die. Right? And it sounds like that, but when you start to think about it, that is how the human brain mind works before you have a chance to do it. So um, I think the vulnerability piece in the context of preparing your team is something that um, probably don't see that much of when it comes to bringing a consultant. I think, do, do you all feel like a similar emotion happens or a similar thing happens, say it's not a consultant, but say it's changing to a new tech platform. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel that there's some similarities there? Because I think that's also a very shared experience across dealers. Change into a new tech form, it, that, that's a nightmare. There's an instant fear, uh, especially if it's a CRM or a DMS. But again, that goes back to the question of explain why first, right? If you're gonna put in a new piece of software, which is gonna affect process, uh, which is gonna affect people's day-to-day -day life, you have to really explain to people, you know, why are we gonna switch from e-lead to drive-centric? Well, here's why. It's not easy to explain. Some people don't understand it at all. There's a huge fear in putting any piece of software in. That's why, you know, before I ever put software in, I always made sure that Anytime the vendors that I was going to be potentially working with that were going to do demos or give presentations, I made sure that I had people at all different levels in the dealership involved in the actual demo process to ask questions because it would be arrogant for me to just make that decision without having a lot of collaboration from the people that have to use it on a daily basis. No different than bringing in a consultant. It's the same thing. A dealer or 
president of a company or whoever can't just bring in a consultant without explaining to people, you know, why are they coming, right? Like, where do we have this opportunity and where do you feel that, you know, they can help you, um, you know, find opportunities and do your job better. And, you know, you know, it's like getting a DMS or CRM is like getting divorced. It's awful. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we hear this word why a lot. Or getting married. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. So, so we hear this word uh, "why" a lot, and uh, we heard a little bit about cross training in the in the um, the panel before this, and uh, how how Daniel uh, sent a, a, um, a uh, I think it was an accounting clerk to GM school uh, to, to to understand the the part statement and dissecting that. And I used the example I was telling Todd that I started to educate my sales force on what floor plan expense is and why it's always been important, but as interest rates continue to climb, the, the fact that that car sits there each day costs X amount of dollars and why we're so obsessed with the turn rate and everything. But again, it goes back to the word why, and I think that I know that's something I'm gonna bring away from this conference and, and working with Todd is to kind of make sure as many of our associates and team members at, at our businesses understand the everybody's why, both um, personally, but also professionally. I mean, a lot of people in sales have never been exposed to service and vice versa. And I know I'm, when I go back to the store, I'm going to try to spend a lot more time uh, with my, especially frontline employees that, that deal with dozens or hundreds of people a day of, of why they do the things they do to be more uh, empathetic to them. I want to just mention something too that I think is important, especially in the automobile business. There's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of family car dealerships out there, right? Um, small stores or even larger groups where there's a lot of family involved. And what I've learned over the last year and a half doing this, right? Like in a lot of cases, I'm almost like a uh, like a social worker or a therapist in a lot of cases because there's brothers and sisters that don't get along or brothers and brothers that don't get along or the father's fighting with the son or there are people that work in the dealership that are family members and there's conflicts there too. It was helpful for me because of the fact that I grew up working with my father and um, we didn't always get along. And my mom worked at the dealership too back when we were really, you know, we we're just, just one store and it was real small. But I think if you're going to choose a consultant and um, you have that dynamic, I think it's important to maybe find a consultant that can relate to that as well because that causes, um, it can cause a lot of problems. Um, I mean, we have a client who's, Similar, right? I think you know who I'm talking about. Where it's a brother and sister, and yeah. they're like yin and yang. Um, yeah. They're great people, yeah. but it's it. You have to be able to navigate that too as a consultant when you come in. And the other thing too, I would say is, um, depending on what you're hiring a consultant for, um, you know, you have to you have to hire someone who knows what it's like to deal with being responsible for a lot of people. Um, if they weren't responsible for a lot of people. They don't necessarily understand that pressure because uh, sure, the there, is a, lot, there is a lot the of decisions you may carry. Correct. There's a lot of decisions that affect. It doesn't matter if you got a store with 40 employees or you're responsible for a group of 4,000 or, 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 or 10,000 or whatever, right? Like the, the decisions you make affect people's families and that's a lot of pressure. So if you can talk to somebody and have personal conversations with them that aren't necessarily quote unquote work conversations about that pressure, um, which I do have with clients that are dealers and non-dealers as well, I think that's helpful. Um, and that would be one question I would ask a consultant, right? Like, were you in a position ever where you were writing a check um, or you were responsible for a lot of people? I think that's important. Very much. I think the similar thing, um, if you are a larger group, or you, you know, in a sim similar situation as you, where you have an executive team, that's a very different dynamic also than a family business where you have to not be able to understand and navigate executive level dynamics and pressures and like what is important to each individual one and how do you actually navigate those things together? Um, we have a couple questions and what I'm going to do is uh, we have eight minutes left. And um, I'm going to actually go around to the people that ask the questions on the app. And uh, I think it'd just be better if you communicate your questions directly. And then if there are any other questions or we have time, uh, we'll go to those. Uh, the first one is Eric Haig, Alan Haig's son. You recognize the last name. Here's the future of mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. So Kimberly, Todd, this question is really for you two, uh, particularly you, Todd, you know, having been on both sides of the fence here. But my question really was about the gulf between strategy and execution. 
you know, my past is in strategy consulting, and I feel like I've been on that side where you're writing an expensive white paper, you know, you're, you cut it, you, the check is cut by the client, but nobody, no party walks away feeling good about it. So let's imagine an engagement where a consultant comes in, but is unable to kind of be at that dealership level and be meeting with store by store employees. You know, how does someone actually create a successful engagement without having kind of that personal connection with employees at the dealerships? Um, I, I think it's impossible for a consultant to, to actually make recommendations without really being involved in the day-to-day -day operations of any business. Uh, I think if you're just coming in from the outside, kind of like I mentioned before, and literally a day in the life of, a day in the life of the GM, a day in the life of the sales manager, a day in the life of the, the service advisor. Um, it was helpful for me because I, again, I was born and raised in the car business, so I can relate to people extremely well uh, in a car dealership. And I also can relate well to vendors too because I have a very good understanding of dealership culture. I've attended conferences and conventions for the last 25 years. And I understand the challenges of putting technology, especially you know, into a car dealership. But I think someone from outside this industry is gonna have a very, very difficult time. And if they claim that they're gonna solve your problems but they're not gonna spend time with your people directly regardless of the size of the organization, I don't think it's gonna work. Um, regardless of whether it's a small store or a public, because I saw it when I worked in a, in a, in a public as well. Um, it, it takes it takes very detailed knowledge of, of day to day. And what I try to do is um, meet as many people as I can, and I just gather information and I find areas of opportunity. And once I find those areas of opportunity, uh, I get back with the executive team or the owner or whoever originally reached out to me. And then we prioritize those things together. And then we put timelines together in ownership of who's gonna be responsible for what. And I'll kind of lay the, frame, uh, the framework out as to how it's supposed to be done. But it takes a lot of time depending on what those challenges are. We did this when I worked with you, right? It, it just, it takes a lot of time. I, I'm aligned, I, I'm having a hard time thinking about something that would work if that consultant is engaged in really getting to know the people because the strategy can be amazing. But there's a cultural piece to this and I think an effective consultant, they're, you know, part of what they're doing is delivering the message. If they don't understand and respect the culture, it's gonna be really hard to push those ideas through. And then I think this is just a learning, like the older I get, I get pretty practical. I love strategy, don't get me wrong, I was kind of grown up on strategy and love it, but it doesn't make sense unless you have part of your plan is executional. And I've even gotten to the point where I bring somebody back kind of for a tune up, or I did this once, it was tough, but I would consider it again, where if we were able to execute, the consultant was paid kind of like an extra bit because it's like you've got to operationalize this stuff otherwise you just sit with like that was a nice experience or or like what i said before it's a really expensive endeavor for for not but i i'm aligned i have a hard time figuring out how it would work if you're not if you don't get in there and kind of get your hands dirty that's part of it and uh t something to touch on briefly we talked a little bit about this in our pre-call about no matter how big of a task or, or project that you hired a consultant for make sure to kind of bake in some small wins that can happen very, very early in the process so your team gets buy-in to say, wow, okay, we see some progress, we see some movement forward, and I think you'll, you'll get uh, more uh, collaboration from the team if they see those early small wins and celebrate small wins. That's something I'm trying to do more in my life with my team is celebrate the small victories. I think if you're writing things down, that's a really important and simple one to focus on. What can we win on very quickly, right? The consultant, the person that hired them, how can we get a small win in place as soon as possible, right? Even if, it's, if it seems menial, just to have something that generate that energy. I love that. It's very practical. And I think very uh, attainable. Uh, we have time for one more. Um, we have, uh, it'll be a fast answer. John Foley, where are you? You asked a question on the app. I think really you've answered the question um, pretty well to this point. So maybe just zooming in on the last part, um, you know, and, and Todd, you can probably speak from experience here, but what are, you know, what have teams done or owners to prepare their team uh, for your arrival that has have been, you know, most successful, best practice? I, I think um, 
gathering everybody together and explaining, you know, first of all, why, what opportunities they see, what challenges they see in the business um, that are coming in the future or may already be there now is extremely important. And then explaining who the consultant is, who he or she is, why they're coming, how they were successful, and then eventually, you know, what you want the outcomes to be. Uh, I think that's probably, you know, a pretty basic answer. But, um, you know, again, I've, Andrew was very clear um, when he hired me with his staff, and I've had a couple of clients that have not been so clear, so it's definitely been a little bit more of a challenge. So the clear, you know, the clear objectives, the clear challenges, who's coming, why he or she's coming, and then what we hope to get, and then, you know, with some sort of timeline in place is probably, you know, probably the best thing you could probably do if you're, if you're going to go down that road. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one? I, just for a, a small win that I did with my team is I took my executive team out out to dinner and and Todd I had Todd fly in for it to to be part of the the the, the process and I think uh, you know the team really appreciated that that you took the time out of your your schedule to to come down and and vice versa that you were included in that process you know because we got to kind of again talk business aside talk personal stuff and our whys outside you, of the you got to be able to build trust um, you know and. Sometimes, you know, my personality might not work for some organizations and, and vice versa, but if there's no trust, then it's never going to work. So, you know, the people that work in the business have to trust the consultant and, and vice versa. If there's no trust, it's, it's going to fail. Kimberly, you get the last word. I don't know if I have a lot more to offer. I think these are great suggestions. Okay, who's your favorite, Paul or Kyle? No. <laughs> <laughs> we know because Kyle's not in the room. Easy answer. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. You can pass. Pass. Both have their strength. <laughs> okay, well, uh, can we hear for our panelists, Kimberly, Todd, Andrew? Thank you so much for sharing some of your wisdom and your time with us today. Thank you for spending time with us. Appreciate it.